Good evening, good people. Oh, look at this. Well, the ads, yes, the ads keep uh, keep me uh, in this profession. They keep me rich, you see. Hello, Matib. Muckets here as well. I don't know who that first person is, but hello, welcome to you. Of course, everybody's been revising. What a silly question. Subban, are you alright? Oh, Alamir, oh, I should have known. Should have known. Surprising that you were first on the chat, actually, because you've not been uh, not been first to attend all year, have you? There we go, yeah, the burns keep coming. The burns keep coming. We're going to do some computer science today, people. We're going to do some revision. Who knows how long we'll be here for? Yeah, at the risk of turning this revision session into just slandering everybody. Oh, don't say that. Hopefully, uh, Rayhan has had a very structured, productive period of revision, and he is on it. Or maybe not. Wait for a few more people to turn up, and then we'll get cracking. Right now, I have a list of all of the different things that people wanted to cover. And you sent me the list. I've got all the chapters that I will hit first through order of popularity. And then if, any, if there's anything else at the end that people want to talk about, then I will do that. So let's have a look then at some of our topics. And before we begin... Don't forget that we are looking at the EDUCAST exam board. Monday the 12th of June is our exam. That is the component one exam on Monday and it is an afternoon exam. It's probably you, Ahmed. Uh, yeah, turn, uh, probably turn, turn your speakers up. I mean, that's all you've got to do. All right. So what the first thing that we're going to cover today is... Chapter 1.9. Believe it or not, this is quite surprising. The most people, the, the most the thing that people wanted me to cover most was legislation, which was surprising. So we're going to do legislation. We're going to cover principles of programming, which is chapter 1.4. We're going to cover 1.8, which is program construction. And we're going to look at 1.5. But specifically in 1.5, we're going to cover changeover and maintenance in there. Um, and also documentation as well. So three different things. And then 1.6, we're going to briefly look at HCI, which is Human Computer Interface or Human Computer Interaction, depending on what you're looking at. And also uh, 1.3, specifically looking, it's massive 1.3, so that's algorithms and programs. Um, and we're going to look at some sorting. We're going to talk about uh, counts and row values, because that's something that's just glossed over normally, but it won't take too long, that. Uh, and then big O notation as well. Okay. And then if people want to fire in suggestions, by all means, you do that. Absolutely no problem whatsoever. So, let's get stuck in then to chapter 1.9. Arguably, in my opinion, the driest of all of the chapters. And there's no getting around that, unfortunately. But what I've done for you is I've broken this down into four different areas. So we've got economic... Uh, moral and ethical, we've got legal and we've got cultural. These are all the things that are contained within the chapter and most of the time we go for the legal stuff, all right? But don't forget, everything that happens in computer science will have a knock-on effect to the economy because we are buying and selling products and using digital products to make money. Moral and ethical, what we create, is it moral and is it ethical? So the moral of it, it's right and wrong, basically, um, and they're not clear-cut, so when parents, for example, monitor children's internet activity, for instance, are they being protective or intrusive? And that's something that we might have to discuss. Okay, cultural, um, that relates to how society works. So politics is increasingly digitized in a contemporary society. Owning a smartphone is increasingly the norm and people can be more, can easily meet each other, uh, talk to each other beyond their own social, social circle. And the term cultural can mean anything relating to human civilization. Lots of different cultures have different rules, for example. Um, China have different search engine optimization. Still use Google. Uh, however, 
they have they see a different flavor of Google than we do because it's a lot more restrictive. So uh, this is not for OCR nor AQA. This is for the Educast exam board. Yes, which is WJC. It's part of that, All right? So computer-related laws. There are some of them that you will have to know, uh, and it's not an exhaustive list. It's only four. So you've got the General Data Protection Act. So sorry, yeah, Data Protection Act 1998, and it's now uh, it's been updated. Got it updated in 2018. And also, inside there, you've got the General Data Protection Regulation, which is a European law, which we still follow. Uh, and in addition to that, we've got Computer Misuse Act 1990. Yes, this is most of the same. Coal. We've got Computer Misuse Act 1990. We've got the Copyright Design and Patents Act, which came in in 1988. And we've also got the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act in 2000, which is called the Reaper Act for short. So they're the four that we tend to talk about, okay? Now, in the Data Protection Act, when you're revising this, break it down. Don't learn it all, that's my advice to you. Learn enough of what I'm about to tell you. So eight principles there, I wouldn't I wouldn't memorize all eight principles. You're never gonna be asked to talk about all eight principles. I would probably go with half of that, four principles, and you've also got a couple of key roles in there, which I'd recommend you to learn. So there's three key roles and also a couple of exemptions alongside that as well. And that'll give you a broad, um, a broad spectrum of answers for the questions. And when we talk about the Data Protection Act and we talk about data, there are two types of data that we need to be talking about. And that's personal data, which are things like your name, your address, and um, your date of birth. Or you might be talking about sensitive data, which is a lot harder to get from people. Personal data is just general stuff that you can uh, band about and you can't really do anything with personal data. But when it comes to sensitive data, like your ethnic origin, your religious views, your political opinions, uh, sexuality and criminal records and things like that, those things, um, people form opinions of you when you bring out sensitive data. All right, so usually that's normally hidden or protected for you, okay? So you've got eight principles on the screen there, and a couple of ones that I'd remember if I was you. Firstly, personal data shall be protected fairly and lawfully. Personal data shall be obtained only for one or more specified and lawful purposes. So if your employer is keeping your data and using it for things that you never agreed to, then that is unlawful. Personal data shall be adequate, relevant, and not excessive. Why do you need to know my political views if I'm joining uh, my college, for example? Right? There is no need for it, therefore they should not be storing it. Personal data shall be accurate and, where necessary, kept up to date. Uh, and it falls on both sides keeping things up to date. Um, but your employer should catch up with you uh, on a regular basis to, to make sure that data is up to date. And that's things like your address, next of kin details, and that kind of stuff, okay? House address is sensitive information, yes. Sensitive information. Um, personal data process for any purposes or purposes shall not be kept for longer than necessary. So, you don't wanna keep it for necessary, uh, for as long as long uh, longer than needed. So we normally keep it for six years before we uh, delete the data permanently. And that's so students can apply to us uh, for references and things like that. We can use the data. Personal data shall be processed in accordance with the rights of data subjects under the Act. And you, you are um, you are the data subject. All right, that's you. So uh, um, you you have rights under the Act, and therefore your data should be protected. And appropriate technical and organisational measures shall be taken against unauthorised or unlawful processing. So first we need to detect that that's happening and then we need to take action against it. And when your data is stored, it can't just be left unencrypted, for example, it must be protected. So personal data shall not be transferred to a country or territory outside the European economic area. And that's normally one that I see in exams quite a lot because it's easy to remember that if, it's, if your data is processed outside of the EU, they don't have the same laws that we do and that we've agreed to inside the EU. Okay, so that's one that students usually remember. So there are the eight principles and there are three key roles. And the first one is the information commissioner. Now this changed recently and the information commissioner is 
think of this like the top level, okay? This is the overarching person, it's the commission, it's the person who the parliament have empowered to enforce the act. And that's John Edwards at the moment. You won't be expected to reference the guy's name, all right? So don't worry about that, but you need to know that um, the information commissioner is the top level. Then the information commissioner can investigate organizations like ours, and this is um, our executive principal, uh, and that's classed as the data controller. So whoever's in charge of your organization is responsible for all the data subjects or the people beneath them, making sure that they're protecting data. And there's the data subject, and that's you. All right. So there are the three key roles for the Data Protection Act. Now, you can take any of these exemptions. Um, normally, I go for national security, um, so people can access your data if it risks national, national security. All right. Also, in addition to that as well, if you think about it, your examination marks and personal data can be contained. So things like uh, examination scripts, when you write your exam on Monday, the exam board can take that question and use that as a part of their moderation process or a part of their exemplar material, for example, because they technically take that from you and it then showcases it on their behalf. All right. But you can have any of those exemptions up there. And there's things uh, about, you know, mental health and personal data, um, physical or mental health there, where we can section people under the Mental Health Act. Therefore, we can access their information and find out who they are. Um, we also have historical purposes and stat statistical analysis. That might be things like census data. Um, and then at the bottom there, bottom right corner, you've got personal data process for the purposes of making judicial, crown or ministerial appointments. So that might be criminal record checking. Um, it might be checking you out for an honour, like you get a knighthood or an NBE or an OBE, for example. They have to check your background to make sure you are who you say you are. All right. Now, when it comes to Data Protection Act, um, my advice would be to screenshot this uh, and keep that for your notes, etc. Because this is the exam board summary. So um, questions have been asked about this in the past. And then this is what was uh, referred to in the mark scheme. All right. There are the eight points that were on there before, mostly. I have no idea if this will be on the exam. If I knew that, then I won't be allowed to teach it. Okay. And then the second one there, general data protection regulation. So this is attached inside the Data Protection Act, but that's the exam board summary. And we'll talk a little bit more about the general data protection regulation in a moment. But think about it. What is it? It was created by the EU. It's a set of rules to protect the privacy of all the European Union citizens. So any country inside the EU follows the same rules. Okay. And it's to simplify the data, privacy, and consent legislation across the EU in the digital age. All private data must be collected lawfully and with consent. That's why websites now ask you about cookies every single time. And it's so annoying, but they have to do it. Otherwise, potentially, they uh, would be going against GDPR laws. The types of data considered personal under existing legislation include name, address, and photos. GDPR extends the definition of personal data so that something like an IP address can be personal data. So people can't scrape your IP address. That's not allowed anymore. It also includes sensitive personal data such as genetic data and biometric data, which could be processed to uniquely identify an individual. Okay. Uh, yeah, I play Roblox all the time. All right. Under GDPR, it's a legal requirement that data breaches such as hacking are reported to relevant authorities within 72 hours. If it's outside of 72 hours, then you can be fined. Um, and also, you can be shut down. So you've got to be careful. Businesses also need to make it easier for consumers to access their data and be very clear on how their data is being processed and used. GDPR also acknowledges the right to be forgotten. So if you want to get your data removed from somewhere, all you have to do is ask. You don't have to fill in any complicated forms anymore and all that stuff. You just ask and they, by law, have to get rid of it. Parental consent is required for the processing of data under 16-year-olds. 16-year-olds. 
Okay, so if you're over 16, then you don't need parental consent for processing of data. And data processors can be directly liable for the security of personal data. Now that is the exam board, okay? The exam board summary. However, you can put it into these eight boxes here. You have the right to be informed about what people are doing with your data. You have the right to access your data at any time. You have the right to uh, rectification, so you can rectify your data and edit it. The right to object to processing, so you say you can't use my data anymore. So rights in relation to automated decision making, making and profiling. That refers to credit checks and things like that. You have the right to be forgotten at any time and you have the right um, to data portability, so you're able to move your data between organizations if you wish and the right to restrict processing of data, okay? So that's GDPR and the Data Protection Act. GDPR is the most recent one, um, and that's why the exam board likes to hover around it, all right? So the right to restrict processing there, Ahmed, um, that means if you don't want your data to be accessed for a certain thing, then you can tell them that you don't want that. So if I, for example, if I come to Oldham 6 Form and say, I don't want Oldham 6 Form to use my... Um, phone numbers for contact, I want you to use email instead, then they have to respect that right, okay? That's what it means. Do we have the right as is or can we reword? Uh, no, you can reword it, you can reword it as long as you get the point across, all right? No problem whatsoever. So the Computer Misuse Act 1990, there are four offenses inside here. Uh, and think about the Computer Misuse Act. It's people using digital services and computers for malicious reasons, okay? It's the EDUCAS exam board, which is WJEC, the Welsh board, all right? The Computer Misuse Act 1990 was passed in response to rising levels of computer crime. It's quite old, it really needs updating because things have moved on quite a bit. So, four offences, technically three, you've got uh, three and three A, that count as one each. But basically, section one, says unauthorized access to computer material, right? So that can be for from accessing using the password, all right, uh, or something like that, or basically gaining access by sitting on someone's computer and accessing their files. Two, unauthorized access with intent to commit or facilitate commission of further offenses. That might be taking someone's data and then using it to uh, commit fraud. For example, all right, this is a level. Section three, unauthorized acts with the intent to impair the operation of a computer. So that might be something like a, a kill USB or a piece of software to shut down your computer, ransomware, uh, and it's basically inhibiting the use of your computer. Section three A is making, supplying, or obtaining articles for use in the offense under section one or three. So if I make uh, a document, a PDF, that shows you how to hack somebody or shows you how to DDoS somebody, then that is a breach of section 3A under the Computer Misuse Act because I'm creating documents to facilitate and to train other people to do things against the Misuse Act, okay? Um, spamming emails to a teacher, go on to the Computer Misuse Act. Um, it, it depends. Uh, it depends if you're causing harm by that. Realistically, you are, you, you are under offence there because you are creating um, a nuisance using digital services, all right? So I would say so. So make sure you don't get caught doing that or you, nobody can uh, find out your IP address. All right. So, you know, a couple of things there. In those, in those different offences, what can be the penalty for those? For example, uh, unauthorized access to computer material can land you with six months in prison up to a £5,000 fine, five-year prison sentence, five-year prison sentence, or a 10-year prison sentence. In the exam, are you expected to uh, list how long you would have a prison sentence for? No, you are not. I would say, as long as you're saying it can end up in a prison sentence or a large fine, that would be plenty um, for these things, all right? So that's the Computer Misuse Act. Short and sweet, that one, which is quite nice. Okay, I don't think I've seen the Computer Misuse Act question before, which is quite interesting. 
Copyright Design and Patents Act. It wasn't created for the digital sector. However, we use it for the copying of software and things like that. We've got four exemptions, four offences and plenty of exemptions. So under the Copyright Design and Patents Act, copying work, for example, burning another copy of Windows OS to give to a friend, illegal. Creating uh, a CD, or what we call, used to call back in my day, burning a CD of um, all different music for your friend, illegal. Rent, lend, or issue copies of the work to the public, for example, making your own music collection. Um, yes, we well, um, you have to find, you have to send Matt to court and find him guilty. You have to find the CD with the original information on it. Perform broadcast or show work in public. For example, showing your favourite film to a large group of people without a special broadcast licence. Okay, there are some exemptions to that, but there we are. Or you can't, uh, also, it's a, a breach to adapt the work, all right? There are exemptions to that. However, you can't take an existing piece of software, change some icons and sell it on, right? So you might see things like that in uh, in the news at the minute. Uh, there's a famous example of uh, Colin the cat cat Caterpillar Cake. I don't know if you've seen that. That isn't to do with digital and software, but it's Copyright Design and Patents Act because someone from a different supermarket that I won't name created a caterpillar cake that looked very, very similar and also used a similar name, all right? But I won't tell you who that was there. You can do some research online, all right? Now, exemptions. So someone like Matt, for example, um, could have said that he was burning a CD for educational purposes and there was no profit being made. Therefore, he would be exempt from the Copyright Design and Patents Act. You can copy and lend works to libraries, uh, but they need a specific license. So every library has a specific license to do this kind of thing. Um, and it has to be in date as well, not dated. You can produce a backup of your work for personal use. That doesn't constitute to copyright. And then you can also replicate work in order to criticize or report on them. That might be a journalist or something like that. You can play sound recordings for a non-profit, like a, a charity or a club, a society, something like that. Um, and also you can record broadcasts for the purpose of listening to, watching or viewing at a more convenient time. If you've ever had something like Sky, um, you can record different programs and watch them later on. And that is not a breach of copyright design and patents act there. All right. If you downloaded the video, uh, if you download the video, you're still making a copy. Unless you're a charity, it's still illegal. Even if you stream that vid, that um, video, you might have heard at the moment there's uh, legislation coming in about um, streaming on uh, sticks like uh, Amazon Fire Sticks and things like that, where people use live uh, live TV through streaming on the internet. Yeah, using VPNs and things like that. That is illegal. Live TV, you need a special license for it. Making a copy of it or showing it or basically streaming the service and taking money for it, then that is illegal. All right? Yeah, the Premier League thing. That's what I was thinking about, yeah. Crazy, isn't it? Going to law, Ahmed. Going to law. Fix it. Right, so also you can make a copy of a computer program in order to study and test it and to see how it works. A famous example of that is the WannaCry ransom piece of software. It was copied and, cre and, and opened up and they, they figured out what the um, solution or the fix was to it. All right, so there we are. Now, the last one. The Reaper Act, okay, the Regulation of Investig Investigatory Powers Act. The ten principles in here, and this isn't that widely known, okay. So you've got a couple of provis provisions of the Act, and ten acts in total, or ten main provisions. We've got regulate the circumstances and methods by which public bodies may carry out covert surveillance. So this is very sneaky beaky stuff. We're talking uh, MI6 kind of level stuff. Uh, GCHQ are involved in this as well. And it's how the government can use its powers for the national security of everyone in the country. 
okay? Everyone in the country. Now, I don't know why I've not changed anything. Let's have a look. Is that any better? Okay, so um, regulate the circumstances by uh, and methods by which public bodies can carry out covert surveillance. Okay, covert surveillance. That means without notifying someone or without being caught in the first place. All right, covert surveillance. We also have um, lays out the statutory framework to enable public authorities to carry out covert surveillance in compliance with the requirements of the Human Rights Act, okay? Now, governments, they can't just go in and take your data, right? They have to comply with a framework, right? Statutory means that everyone has to follow. It's a standard, all right? It's a standard. Now, it enables public authorities to carry out covert surveillance in compliance with the requirements of the, the Human Rights Act, Human Rights Act is for um, is in place. It's actually trying to well, they're trying to change some elements of the Human Rights Act at the moment. Okay, but there's certain things that we can't do. So if we're holding people, for example, we have to feed them, we have to give them water, we can't um, leave them for a certain period of time. We can only hold them in custody for a long period, a certain period of time, and that can be extended on the proviso of somebody else. Okay, so. This is all to do with governments. We also have um, five broad categories of covert surveillance, and that is directed surveillance. That's where people take pictures. We have intrusive surveillance, which is bugging, and the use of human uh, covert human sources, so informants, undercover officers, spies, that kind of stuff, including watching and following people. Accessing communications data um, and things like recording of emails sent, phone calls made, WhatsApp messages, text messages, all that sort of stuff, and also intercepting communications. So that's where people are sat in a, in a van, basically scanning for um, packets of data, traveling around on the network. All right, so there we are. Also, allows the Secretary of State, okay, Secretary of State at the moment, uh, is it Suella Braverman? I can't remember. Um, to issue an in interception warrant so the government can intercept and tackle people if they feel like the national security is at risk. Also, we've got prevents the existence of interception warrants and any and all data collected with them from being revealed in court. So, for example, you can... We can go and collect someone's information and the government can put a block on that which prevents the government saying how they got that information in the first place. And you've got to think, why would they do that? Okay, why would they do that? It's because other spy organizations like, for example, Russia, they, we don't want to tell them, we don't want to tell them how we um, collect data, what are our covert surveillance methods, All right? I can send this out later on. Um, if people want this presentation um, then or this resource document, they can email me at jbr at osfc.ac.uk and I will send that through to people if they need it. For our class, um, I'll put this on Google Classroom so you've all got access to it or I'll email it out to you all as well. All right. Okay, so six allows the police, intelligence services, HM Revenue and Customs and also people like the council, to demand telephone, internet, and postal service providers to hand over detailed communication records. So we can basically force people, like phone companies, to give you information, which is crazy. Enables the government to demand that someone's hand hands over the keys to protect the information. That could be encryption keys. That could be your iPhone, um, iPhone lock. People go for FaceTime now. Technically, they can get you to unlock it by scanning your face and changing all the security settings so they can get into it. Or 
they can actually break now. They can actually break open uh, iPhones and Android phones, things like that. It's quite easy now. Enables the government to force ISPs to fit equipment. So an ISP is, uh, yeah, I mean face ID, yeah. ISPs, internet service providers like uh, Virgin Media, the government can tell them that they've got to fit a wiretap and they'll go to your green box outside your house on your street somewhere and they'll fit a wiretap. Right? Crazy. Allows the government to demand that ISPs provide secret access to customers' communication. Again, wiretapping. And then make provisions to establish an oversight regime. So creating investigative powers tribunal. There are, um, if, if, for example, somebody appeals, they can go to the tribunal and the three commissioners will be appointed to try the case. All right. So that means that, that makes sure that the people on the tribunal um, or the board can oversee the government to make sure they're not abusing these powers. All right. So there we go. Who'd have thought? Now, the exam board summary is as follows. There you go. Now, I mentioned there, I'm just get me a little pen, right? These organizations, GCHQ, MI6, and MI5, are all government organizations, and they basically are asset gatherings, ga asset gatherings okay? They will gather information. Uh, they're all based in uh, MI6, MI5, based in London. Um, GCHQ now actually have an office in Manchester and they do some fantastic degree apprenticeships, people. Oh, fantastic. Also, it allows GCHQ, MI6, MI5 to carry out equipment interface, also known as hacking personal digital devices upon issue of a warrant. And these devices include personal computers and mobile phones. Everyone is connected. All right. Everyone is connected. All right. So there we are, easy to get into these kind of things. So what would a question typically look like for this kind of thing? In my opinion, legislation usually comes up on exam papers and it's worth anywhere between 8 to 15 marks. It's usually a bit of a heavier weighted question. And you'll see command words like explain, describe, all that sort of stuff. All right. This is just for component one, Jacob. Uh, just for component one, um, I'm feeling generous and I might do a component two live stream before the component two exam, if you're lucky. I mean, it depends how dedicated I feel as a practitioner. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Do I care enough about your education to do that? The question's out. It's out there. It's out there. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how I'm feeling, right? So explain how legislation in place today aims to protect a user from malicious computer damage, eight marks, all right? So you'll see questions like that, all right? And then you can talk about anything like this, yeah? So there's a bit of a summary from what we talked about before. You can pause that video there later on and you can have a look at it. So let's move away from legislation then. Let's go a bit further away from it. And let's talk about ethical issues, okay? Ethical issues. Now, that was my computer on the left-hand side, um, and this is the, this, the computer on the right-hand side is the modern-day machine, isn't it? And we've come quite a long way. Even all these things here, techn technology has advanced, all right? So for people that get this later on, there is a little um, video for you there, all right? But what's happening, especially with ChatGPT, incredible, incredible software that is revolutionizing the way we use digital. Let's not talk about IGB. I'm going to block you. I'm going to block you all. Unbelievable. Do you know IGB? It always, get, always, always comes, creeps in from somewhere, doesn't it? It's an absolute joke. Anyway. Uh, there is no RGB in, in, in my setup at all. Nothing. So we need to think about how we use computers. And one thing that always crops up is man versus machine. Man versus machine. If we've got um, modern day computers, then there's an expensive initial setup to basically remove all the computers out your organization, or sorry, remove all the people outside your organization and replace them with computers. Machines have an expensive initial setup, but once they set up, then they're relatively cheap. You have still have maintenance costs. However, the modern build of things, they tend to last quite a long time. 
they are very accurate machines. They can produce, especially in manufacturing, they can re- they, they can complete simple repetitive tasks very accurately, very accurate, accurately. They are very quick to complete tasks. They have easy completion of repetitive tasks, like I just mentioned, and they never take a break. There are no sick days. We don't have to pay. We don't have to pay anyone. No pension contributions. No national insurance. It's cheap. However, take the humble person working in your organization. They require days off. We can make people work seven days, but that is slavery. All right? An average nine-hour day they can work. Humans are not very good at working for long hours because they get tired. Sick pay and holiday pay. They are expensive because we have to pay a salary. And also, learning takes a long time. They are good at detailed dexterous tasks, though, because we have um, finger digits. Our fingers are very good, very dexterous. Allows us to do detailed tasks, okay? And also, we can make decisions along the way if things go wrong. Although, AI is making a pretty good dent in that at the moment. So, what about a code of conduct, then? All right? So, a code of conduct helps us with the ethics of our organization, And a code of conduct is a document that spells out the rules and responsibilities for employers of an organization. Most code of conducts include IT-related sections. So you might talk about things like the privacy. How how will your employee be monitored while they work for you? All right? All my emails are all public. Can you... Oh, my goodness. I'm at the stage where I'm doing shout-outs for people. Uh, Hi, Luke. Good luck in your exam on Monday, my friend. Privacy, damage. So damage, I'm not shouting everyone out. Wealth therapist. Don't ask Don't ask that person for wealth, wealth advice. It'll be terrible. Damage, both physical damage to equipment and computer misuse. So if somebody, if you break any of my equipment, we've got these fancy new computers up in 242. Yeah, curved screens and all that with really fast computers. If you damage any of those or any computers, in fact, that will, you'll, be on, you'll be on a little... Uh, exclusion or something i'm sure we can sort something out for you all right access levels what you may or may not have access to all right we don't we do not we do not allow you access to the command prompt my goodness there is a way to get it but no definitely not students will try and destroy everything I don't know what's wrong with you all number four copyright infringement and protection of assets so ensuring that the service is not used to breach copyright and that the company assets are kept secure. Okay. Now, your code of conduct, rules for sending emails, a list of websites that are not allowed to be accessed, so blocks lists, for example, instructions for keeping usernames and passwords private, forcing you to change your password on a regular basis, limitations of IT equipment for personal commercial use, reference to data that can be accessed by employees but should be kept confidential, the fact that you can't just send loads of information uh, out of your organization that might damage your reputation, for example. Um, so what happens in in the in the case that we get hacked, for example? What do we do, right? How do we recover from that, right? That's all there inside your code of conduct. And you sign your code of conduct. There's no such thing as free speech. There we go. You have to sign your code of conduct. And if you don't sign your code of conduct, you're not allowed to work there. Crazy. All right. Now, I talked about artificial intelligence. All right. Now, there's lots of development. The military have lots of money and they spend lots of money on things like artificial intelligence and automated decision making. But when it comes to the military and the fact that it can take people's lives, then it starts to become ethically a little bit more serious, okay? So, artificial intelligence and automated decision-making advantages, computers won't react differently based on their mood or lack of sleep. Computers can retain a ridiculous amount of information, so much more than a human. Given the same inputs, the computer produces the same outputs. Think about a simple if statement, for example. Offering consistent advice. Computers are unable to make ethical decisions, so they can't decide or make choices between different people. 
Um, computers are not responsible for their actions, so seeking compensation when things go wrong, that becomes an issue. And computers are only as good as their algorithms, which are created by people, and people have flaws, which means algorithms have flaws. Now, there was um, an AI incident that happened in America where one of their drones that was AI-based um, was programmed to make sure it doesn't hurt uh, children, uh, civilians, that kind of stuff. Uh, and he had a number of blockers that was programmed in there by the controller, okay? Now, what happened was the AI decided that it was just easier to destroy the controller. So it tried to attack the person controlling the drone uh, and just get rid of them altogether to remove all the rules. Uh, and the Americans deny this ever happened, but it's, re it's widely reported it did happen. So you've got to be careful, people. You've got to be careful. Now, what about the environmental impacts? Environmental impacts. With digital and computers, computers can replace paper documents. We can go fully electronic and save trees and the processing of those trees. Sounds simple, right? And it is. So computer networks can be used to send products such as films or music that would otherwise have to be produced and shipped across the world. Right? Now, when I used to play on my PlayStation many, 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 many years ago, everything came with CDs. Um, and you used to have to buy them, come with little bits of paper in them as well. Nowadays, you just do digital downloads, don't you? And with uh, organizations like Google trying to um, basically just produce games online fully and stream games online so you didn't even have to download them at all, it didn't really um, take on. That. It didn't take off, sorry. So there we are. Computers are made up of rare chemicals that need to be mined. There are organizations out there that melt computers down to get the gold from them. Computers are made up of toxic chemicals that are often not properly disposed of. So poorer countries get all of our e-waste and they melt it down for the wires, the cables, the metals. Um, but it causes lots of toxic smoke and a lot of them die early because uh, it's not regulated in other countries. Computers use electricity, which comes mostly comes from burning fossil fuels. However, there is renewable energy now. Computers require a great deal of intensive manufacture to create, all of which requires the burning of fossil fuels. Even electric vehicles, even electric vehicles have a large carbon footprint when they get manufactured. If I can find it, Mahadi, if I can find it. It's probably in a folder somewhere. And what about censorship? Now, this is a weird story. In these remote villages in the UK, they're like in their own little bubbles, right? And they have their own little ideologies and their own little mindsets. And what happened was we connected all of these little towns to something called the internet. And what was discovered was that the people from the rural towns and villages were accessing offensive communications and things online that were basically not true. So people from rural areas and rural villages were not used to being on the internet having wealths, wealth of information. So they basically believe whatever they're told. And on the internet, there are lots of lies. All right? The internet is the physical part. The World Wide Web of the hyperlinks. So the World Wide Web is on the transmission medium, which is the internet. And the internet is made up of all your cables, routers, wireless access points, servers, all that good stuff. They were looking at Ori. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what they were looking at. I can't possibly say. Yes, but see, probably, probably lying all the time. All right. And there we go. So, you know, this is the issue that we've got at the moment. This is the issue. Now, we've seen in the past governments, politicians, powerful people are using the platform to get to as many people as possible. Um, for this chapter, Rayhan, I reckon they'll all be fairly complex. Don't think you'll get many one markers in this. 
Well, if you calming white noise for mind and body, I think uh, all you need to do is listen to some calming white noise for your mind and body and you'll be fine. Just breathe. Okay, so, you know, like I said before, with China and things like that, they block certain things. So you can't get access to certain materials, certain uh, news networks. Even in Russia, Russia, uh, I've got a very um, propaganda-based news reporting service. Okay, so you, you got to watch out. Ta like I said, Tayab before, Tayab, uh, questions like describe and explain. You're talking about the impacts of these things. Um, and usually in large amount questions, you will get things that say um, using your experience from across a number of different areas of computer science. That means you can use anything from the specification to answer the question. So they're all open for you to use any section that you want, not just the legal and ethical side of computer science. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of un unrestricted access to the Internet? Um, people can share and access information that would be very difficult for them to obtain without the internet. People can spread news and atrocities and corruption very quickly and also spread propaganda, ultimately helping to bring those responsible to justice, all right? If you're sending out propaganda, though, that does brainwash people. That is an issue. Disadvantages. Automated filters make it easier for governments to monitor millions of citizens. You're monitored on your internet access, especially in the, the public domain like Google Chrome, GCHQ monitor, um, web access. Computer networks are ultimately owned by governments and large corporations that can control the knowledge to which people have access. And it's easy to disseminate false information or fake news or unconfirmed rumors. People can access vast amounts of illegal information and products such as extreme pornography, for example. So you've got to be careful, all right? Uh, Charlie, we will go through that a little bit, little bit later on. It is on the list. All right. So think about it the next time you go to your supermarket. They're gathering data about you all the time on your little club cards so they know what you're shopping for, what you're buying, when you're buying it. Things like layout, color, and character sets are all being used as well to program people into buying the same things you know when you see certain colors it means certain things you see a microsoft logo you know so to people from different cultures the same piece of information can mean many different things and there are many examples of brands that have failed when they have translated their famous slogans in order to target the overseas market all right so you've got to be careful all right you've got to be careful when you translate things so not everything translates perfectly into different cultures so this is the culture side of the legal and ethical stuff, all right? So there you go. You can see the um, United Nations website in the UK. And then over to, I think that's Arabic. And it looks different because they read from right to left instead of left to right. And what about color paradigms? Did you know in Western Europe, for example, the color, color pink is commonly associated with femininity? That might be... That might not be news to you. However, in Japan, there is no such distinction. Thailand, pink is simply the colour of Tuesday. And yellow in Western Europe can have connotations of caution or alarm. But in China, things like that, it's considered an imperial or a royal colour. So not everyone can wear yellow, for example. All right? Even things down to character sets. People's names mean different things, so you've got to be careful. You've got to care, especially if you're storing things in databases and stuff like that. You have to be careful about what you're storing and the connotations of that. So sometimes, you know, we've got to think about this when we're building digital products. All right. And that's our chapter. Let me just get my pointer back. That's that chapter over. And done with. There we go. Let's go back home. There we go. Okay. That's legislation in a nutshell. How long have we been going for now? Check the time. Where's the time? It's 
50 minutes already. My goodness, right. All right, so the next thing that people voted for on the list was principles of programming, all right? And mainly, it was object-oriented programming and backers no form, right? If people want paradigms, then you're going to have to shout it out, people. Anybody want paradigms? We're talking procedural, event-driven, uh, visual paradigms, for example, stuff like that. That was all of 1.9. 24 hours. Paradigms, anyone? Paradigms. Okay, fine. You're just saying yeah. Let's go for it, right? Morning, John. What is the most important thing to revise? I didn't take any notes. Okay, well, you greasy goblin. Uh, I'm not too sure. Um, you should have really taken notes on everything. Can you send... Uh, Ahmed, I'm not going to send this master slide to you uh, because you don't deserve it. No, I'm joking. Um, yeah, it's fine. Principles of programming, right? Principles of programming, procedural, event-driven, visual, markup, and object-oriented. Right? So, firstly, let's start off with the programming paradigm of procedural. A paradigm, for me, is a style it's a style which we write in. We can decide whichever styles we want because we are independent programmers and we don't take anything off anybody else, right? So we decide what we want to do. Usually, what I've seen in industry is people just learn one and stick with it, but you're not going to be able to move very far if you do that, all right? So a paradigm is a way to classify programming languages based on their features. And languages can be classified into multiple paradigms, all right? So... Programs that run from start to end sequentially are known as procedural paradigms, all right? Now, these are normally, procedural paradigms are normally ones you learn very early on to teach you basic logic. Now, they will continue from top to bottom unless we reach a control statement. And a control statement is something like a loop or it's a selection statement of some kind and it will change the direction of where you're going, all right? Now, what are they made up of? Okay, they're made up of variables and assignments of variables. We have selection iteration and we also have modularity, which gets introduced through procedures. So think about it. If you're asked a procedural programming question, talk about procedures, you bunch of idiots, right? If you don't mention that, oh, I'll, I'll find out where you are, right? I'll come and I'll pay you a visit, tell you how, how you didn't listen to me, okay? So modularity. Right. Now, modularity is good because it introduces something called decomposition. Decomposition is the breaking down of something, isn't it? Yes. So procedural languages, they're, they're also classed as something called imperative languages as well. All right. And they use statements to change the state of the program. So the state means just means the current values of its variables. Right. As the program's running, the variables change based on the state that happens, whether it's a selection statement, a loop, for example. All right. That's it. Simple as. Okay. Now, it is one of the most simple forms of programming that we have. Um, and what if you wanted an example, uh, I would say something like um, Python would be that. Or some, something like that. Something nice and simple. And remember, programming languages can be multiple paradigms. They can share features from other paradigms. So Python is not only procedural, it can be object-oriented as well. Now, People from my class will know my sheer hatred towards Scratch, what it's about, and why it exists. All right? I hate it so much. I hate that stupid cat, and it should be burnt alive. Okay, not the cat. I mean the program. So, as a programmer, it's likely that you'll start with a visual programming language because children like colors and children like graphical things. Okay. I don't get paid enough for 24 hours of live streaming. Wealth therapist. Yeah. So, yeah. Make a donation. Right. Now, you build intuitive um, programs. So you use, use the interface to build programs rather than relying solely on text. And for me, that is the most important thing. That last point on the board there on the screen is the elimination of the user to remember syntax. We're dealing with young people. Think about you at your age. You've got brains like sieves. 
I tell you something, five minutes, forgotten, right? Think about a nine-year-old. If I tell them how, what a selection statement is and how it's built and how it works, they're going to forget it immediately, right? This allows the person to trial and error and drag and drop. Now, it does, it does make use of event-driven programming, right? And all that is, is when you click something, an action happens. When you move your mouse, an action happens. When you press WASD, it moves up. S moves down. A, it moves left. D, it moves right. That is events. Events is key presses, button clicks, hover overs, that kind of stuff, right? And that's what it uses. So talking of event-driven programming, all right, programmers rely heavily on user interactions, and that is the event-driven paradigm, okay? The point of it is it has functions, okay? These functions get actioned when you press something. So you press a button, it calls an event listener, an event listener then processes the action and runs the procedure that you're trying to do, okay? So that might be me right-clicking on the screen, I click the button, it calls the listener for it. There's a little diagram to help you think, remember this, all right? You press the key, the operating system pr processes and informs that the program is active. The event processor decides what it's gonna do. If it's got too many requests or too many button presses or clicks or whatever, it will put it in a queue. It's on a first come, first serve basis, and then it actions the code that it needs, okay? And there we are. I'm interested to know, these people in the chat, are you even from my college? I have no idea. I mean, I'm more than happy for you to be here if you're not, well, you know. Is what it is. No. Whoa, okay. That's good. It looks like I've branched out and moved across organizations now. You should get your teacher, you should ask your teacher to do a live stream as well, and I'll watch theirs. Operating systems, yeah. So there you go. You can all you can have a look at that and, and uh pause the video, that kind of stuff. However, these event listeners that I'm talking about, right, they can be programmed. They can be changed. You can create them. You can even use inbuilt ones as well in your system. So if you use an IDE, you can use them. Python has loads of them built in. So event-driven paradigm, uh, event-driven applications, things like uh, VB.NET, uh, Python, Java, C, that uh, C Sharp is event driven, I believe. So, event driven programming requires the developer not to think of their code in a linear fashion from top to bottom, but rather as a set of actions that get triggered. So, everything's waiting in a big loop, waiting to be pressed, and then when it gets pressed, action happens. All right. So, graphical user interfaces, any games that you create in the future, uh, whether you're using something like Unreal Engine or Unity. These are gaming engines that you can program in. All right. Um, you can uh, make use of event-driven programming paradigms. It's a great question. K-pop. Oh, I, I love it. What fantastic... What I don't even know what that is. All right. There we are. Okay. Now, our next paradigm is markup languages. Markup languages are not programming languages. They are not programming languages. HTML, hypertext markup language, and XML, extensible markup language, okay, they are marking up something. Plain text goes in, we put our plain text and we use tags around the plain text to denote what we want to happen with that text. So the browser that you use dictates what it's going to do. So in your exam question, if you say, oh, my hello world here has H1 tags around it and the tags are surrounded in chevrons and a H1 is for a, a H is for a header, one is the size, so it's the biggest header you can get available to us and you've got a closing bracket with a slash here which denotes the closing tag and the text in between will then turn into a header and the size of it will be made bigger. That, that is perfectly acceptable in an exam. A chevron is like you're less than greater than symbols. Chevrons, they're called chevrons. Okay, so there you go. Commands in HTML are known as tags. They're surrounded by chevrons. Commands are opened 
for example, h1, so that any text that follows will have the command applied to it. Commands are then ended using the forward slash inside the tag. And in the above example, the h1 tag will instruct the browser that the text, this is my web page, should be displayed as a heading. All right. So you got to think about that. Okay. You got to think about that because there's another one as well called XML. Much less discussed, but it stands for extensible markup language. And if you think about HTML, it's for displaying web pages. XML is normally for marking up data for storage. Okay. Storage. So display for HTML. XML is for storage and it looks very similar. It's very customizable and you can make your own tags using XML. Okay. Now with these markup languages, you can combine them with other programming languages or things that would be assumed as programming languages like JavaScript. All right. Also, you've got um, different versions of HTML. We're on HTML5 at the moment. JavaScript there, JavaScript 5 and CSS, which is cascading style sheets. Three. So you can combine these for different styles and make them look fancy and all that sort of stuff. And web development has been taken a battering recently because of HTML generators like Wix and Squarespace and stuff like that. All right. But you can still be a web developer if you want to. Just don't come back to me and say I'm a programmer if you're a web developer because that ain't, that ain't real. Unless you do JavaScript though, I'll give you some credit for that. All right. But there we are, or PHP or something like that, like a server-side language. Now, we've got a weird one here, a weird one, the last of the paradigms before we get into object-oriented. This is non-procedural languages, NPL. And this was originally created for databases, mainly relational databases, where the result is more important. So we view what comes out of the database rather than the steps to get the data, if that makes sense. All right, so we care about the outputs rather than the inputs. We'll just keep changing the inputs to get closer and closer to the outputs that we need. Okay, now in the corner there is Sophia. That was the first artificial intelligence humanoid robot um, that was quite competent at what it did. All right, so users concentrate on define the input and output rather than the steps, sequential steps required in a procedural program language, explaining how the problem. Um, the program, sorry, should perform a task, all right? And they're known as the, uh, declarative languages or mainly AI nowadays. So AI and grammar checkers, they focus on rules, facts, and queries, and they don't require any traditional programming logic. It allows the, it allows the computer to decide what it wants to do, what steps it wants to take to produce the output that you require, Okay. And that's where nowadays our chat GPT-4 um, has to be trained. Uh, GPT-3 has to be trained with regular data and they are non-procedural languages. Okay. So you got to think about those. Now with object-oriented programming, most programming projects will use object-oriented programming and we spend more time on this because the example tends to focus on this a little bit more. If you think about, if you do AS computer science, then this comes up in most of the component two papers at AS level, all right? So this, we spend a bit more time on it, all right? So most programming projects use object-oriented programming, all right? And once you understand the basics of procedural languages, the normal progression is to move on to object-oriented programming because it's much faster and it models the real world um, and we call it OOP in industries, all right? So we call it OOP. Now, uh, on there, okay, it's making me do some weird animation. You also get everything that we got before, selection, iteration, assignment, identifiers and, and constants. Moving from procedural to object-oriented is much more straightforward, okay? Now, the key difference is, is that object-oriented, if you have procedures in procedural language, in procedural languages, you replace them for things called classes, objects, and methods. Mainly methods. Methods are just the same as procedures, really. Uh, and classes and procedures both offer modularity and reusability of code. And that's the major benefit. Reusability 
modularity, the major benefits. Okay. Now, we've got a few characteristics that define object-oriented programming. Encapsulation, which is the method of uh, hiding through public and private methods. We have polymorphism, which is a method of overriding and changing behavior. We have something called inheritance, where we inherit from different classes and uh, subclasses all the way down. We have classes and objects themselves, which create you reusable code. And we have something called abstraction, where the complexity is removed for the person. All right. So I'll just, um, oh, okay. The image, the track, there you go, image will show, there you go. Right, so that is an object-oriented diagram. We've got car there, and car is known as the parent or the base class. Parent or base class. Ford, Jaguar, and Aston Martin, they are all subclasses of the car class. A Ford is a car, a Jaguar is a car, and so is an Aston Martin, okay? And every time you create one of these, these are called objects, yeah? Every time you create one of these, you are instantiating, that is a typical word that we use in object-oriented programming, and you basically create a new object. It's called instantiation. Um, so Ford was born from the, the superclass or the base class, parent class, car. Now if car, uh, Ford, Jaguar, Aston Martin all have common attributes. A Ford has doors, uh, so does a Jaguar, Aston Martin. They all have engines. They all have four wheels, I believe. Um, what else do they have? They have uh, a gearbox. They all have headlights. They all have um, airbags, for example. So, when I'm creating these objects, why am I doing it over and over again? Why am I redeclaring all the variables? Why am I doing that over and over and over? I wouldn't. I'd create one instance of all those things. So, in the car class, you'd have all your seats, you'd have your engine, you'll have your headlights, you'd have all that. And then, when you create a Ford, it inherits all of those variables. Variables in object-oriented programming are called attributes. So let's talk about objects, classes, and methods then. So our variables are called attributes, and our procedures or functions are called methods. Okay? So to try and think about them objectively. Procedural languages have variables, and they have procedures and functions. Object-oriented has attributes, which are variables, and it has methods, which are your procedures and your functions, okay? So methods are fundamental. We can reuse them as many times as we want. And you think about our Teslas, yeah? Our modern day self-driving vehicles, they have a method called turn left, for example. And it's provided a parameter with the angle of degrees that we need to turn, the speed in which we need to turn at, and that's all determined by the machine sensors. And we just reuse it. We just reuse it, okay? And there's that word at the bottom there, instantiation. That just means born from. So you were instantiated from your mother. Think about it like that, okay? So to set an attribute of a class, you need the reference created during instantiation. So here is a bit of code to show you how to do that. And this... Here is a class, the car class. It creates a new car class and it passes in everything to a, a subclass called Ford. So Ford now can inherit reg number from the car, the car class, the make from the car class and the model from the car class. If I created Aston Martin and then did Aston Martin equals new car, Aston Martin would also have access to reg number, make, and model. And remember, those are unique. They are not shared. They are unique to the Ford, unique to the Aston Martin, and unique to the uh, Jaguar. Okay? And then I print them out. 
Simple as that. So attributes are treated as variables within the object and they're accessed by using a full stop and they'll all appear. If you use a good IDE um, when you're programming, they'll, they should all appear for you. Okay. So you can assign attributes or use them in other expressions in the exact same way you use a variable and each object is distinct. So I said there, they are unique and they don't share. So I've got a question before, what is encapsulation? So encapsulation is what we call the technical implementation hidden within the object. And you're like, John, what the hell are you on about? Well, encapsulation is just hiding or showing data across your program, all right? So when I think of capsule encapsulation, I always think, you know, like a, oh, that's not the best drawing. You know, like a capsule, like a, a paracetamol capsule or something like that. All of the drug of the paracetamol is contained inside the pill itself, right? In powder form. That's it. So encapsulation is providing a payload and we can hide it from people. All right? Yep. So encapsulation is the method of hiding. And if you see a class diagram, you'll either see a plus for public, a minus for um, private, or even a hash symbol in front of the variable for protected, okay? So classes can hide how they work from developers who may wish to use them in their programs. And you might say, John, why do we, tr why do we actually hide stuff from people? Why is it private? Why can't we just keep everything public? And it all comes down to security and also you don't want any erroneous edits happening to your code. You don't want an accidental edit somewhere that will mess up something else, right? So getting and setting functions in object-oriented programming, the reason why we use those is, again, for security. We don't want people messing up our inputs, messing up our variables, okay? So anyone using the class needs only to understand the interface to the class. So that we only need from the class itself, its methods and its attributes. Okay, so it's procedures and its variables. If you're talking about object-oriented programming, you're talking about encapsulation, you can talk about something that was discussed in the chat there, which is a setter, which sets variables from outside of the class and a getter which just retrieves the variable from outside the class. Because we want to prevent people coming in to our class and just taking information. So getters and setters, they're called. Now, inheritance, I hope inheritance comes up in the exam because people are very, very good Okay, they're very, very good at talking about inheritance because it's a natural thing. In the real world, inheritance has a very specific meaning. We inherit genes from our parents, in some cases, money from our relative. That would be nice, wouldn't it? That would be nice. The idea is that something is being passed down through some sort, some sort of relationship. So inheritance in object-oriented follows the same principle. So here I've got two classes. I've got a car class and a van class. If you notice, they both have the same attributes, okay? Attributes in the top here, uh, and we'll have our uh, methods as well. So we can see methods with our brackets. Oh, these are all, oh, these are all um, methods actually. So all of our methods, they're all the same. So why would we declare them in two separate classes? There is no point in doing that. So we'll create a super class called road vehicles and they will have all of the methods inside there. And now, when you create a car class object from road vehicles, car inherits all five of those methods. The van class also inherits all five of those methods, and I've only had to write them once. And that makes sense. It might not look like it makes sense with just two objects, but if I have a million objects, it means I'm not declaring a, a million multiplied by five sets of 
uh, methods. Okay, so it's much, much more efficient. Now, it might look like there's nothing in there at all. Right? You, as a human, will say, oh, there's nothing in there, but the computer knows that there are five methods in here. You just, you just can't see them. So that's inheritance. Something that students tend to struggle with, and that's polymorphism, which is another uh, a feature of object-oriented programming. And you definitely have used it before. Okay, So if I said A here was worth 10, uh, and B was worth 10. If I did 10, uh, A plus B, that would be 10 plus 10, that would be 20, wouldn't it? All right. If it detected those as integers, A was an integer and B was an integer, then it would perform an arithmetic, an arithmetic operation. Okay. Whereas this one here, if I put cat and I put dog, we'll check the variables and it'll say A is a string and B is a string. Therefore, this now, this operator is not an arithmetic operator, it's a concatenator. So it will create cat dog as one word. It'll concatenate them. So that is polymorphism. It's changing the plus symbol here has changed from an arithmetic number adder to um, a string concatenator. And that's just the plus symbol has many different behaviors. So when we talk about polymorphism, we're talking about poly being many and morph being forms. So it's many forms and it's a method of overriding behavior. So depending what we give it will dictate how it performs. Okay, polymorphism, changing and overriding behaviors based on its inputs. Okay, does everyone get that? Is everyone all right with that one? It's one that people tend to struggle with. I'll just, I'll just keep talking. I'll just keep talking. Abstraction. In the morning, I drive to work. Okay. Yes, I can drive. I drive vehicles. Uh, and when I go to work, I get into my vehicle. I've not got a clue how it works underneath the bonnet. All right. The engine does some magical things. However, I just turn the key. I put it in the right gear, I press the accelerator, take the brake off, off I go, way off I go, all right? So, abstraction means that we don't need to know what's happening, we don't care what's happening. If I press that accelerator, we should go, we should move forward, all right? And it hides stuff away from the user, and abstraction is used even when you program now for your A-level, okay? abstraction has happened there's no way you know how your compiler works there's no way you know how your interpreter works there's no way you know all of the functions gone in to make that programming language all that difficulty has been abstracted away from you okay simple as that simple as that and what I'm showing you a Metrolink map of Manchester and you can see there, well, where's where's the map? Where's all of the all the churches and the schools, the roads in between, etc.? That has all been abstracted out. It's gone. Why? Because it's useless information that we don't need. Therefore, it's got to go. All right. And there's the car analogy for you there. John can drive a car. John does not know how it works. Simple as that. Does everyone know what Bacchus Noor form is? BNF. Bacchus Noor form. Anyone got any ideas? Hmm. Bacchus Noor form. BNF will be the reason I fail. Oof. Naysayers, naysayers. So off we got. 
standard rules for writing code like syntax okay yeah it's a it's a syntax free grammar it's basically a grammar checker right it makes sure that what you're writing conforms to the programming language so I take Python for example if I put capital P print right that will not be allowed right the rule for the print statement if I get my tablet here for a second and I find my pen where's my pen give me the pen so way of writing down grammar of programming language isn't it yes it is isn't it isn't it so if I write down in Python capital P R I N T BNF will look at that and it'll go right have you got brackets on it yes have you got something inside it no so it'll fail on that bit and it'll also fail on the capital P part and say no you can't have that because it states that a print statement must all have lowercase letters and it must contain something inside the brackets all right happy days happy days right so back as no form what I might do is I might even just skip to a question here give you this first right why do we need languages to be unambiguous think about the compiler here think about turning the code into machine code when we put it through back as no like a filter right it has to be interpreted in one way only that's unambiguous right sorry that is yeah that's unambiguous right ambiguous means it can be interpreted in more than one way ambiguity is the uncertainty of meaning in which different interpretations are possible so it's unambiguous that's what we need it can only be interpreted in one way imagine different computers running the same code with the same inputs getting the different outputs and that would be disastrous because things what we expected from our program would not be what would happen high level program languages must be unambiguous so that is that there is only one way to interpret each program statement and that means you're going to get consistency and that's what we're looking for okay and why so a natural language interface and the exam board compares natural language interfaces that's me and you conversing now this is a natural language interface when I talk to someone and they talk back to me natural language or I type something to you you type something back to me right so why do we have ambiguity problems when I talk to you because I might say words that sound the same. Two, two, and two. Do you know which two I was talking about? Was it T-O? Was it T-O-O? -O, or was it T-W-O? That's called a homophone, by the way. What the hell is that? A computer cannot deal with that. Dialect or your accent, yeah? If you talk very posh or you sound like you're from Australia, mate. Who knows what your computer is going to interpret when it comes to that? So it needs unambiguous un uh, or an unambiguous un unambiguous nature coming on okay um, also use of proper nouns as well also words from other languages in common use and voice patterns so they're all problems and they're from mark schemes by the way so this is what I've used to create all of this really is mark schemes and we build back as no form and we have to follow a number of different rules okay so, when it comes to backers no form, you have non-terminal rules. You have terminal rules or terminal symbols and you have production rules itself, right? There's only three things that backers no form has, that is it. So terminals means you can't express it any further. Non-terminals means you can express it further and production rules are the final uh, it's the final rule so let me let me see let me let me show you what i'm talking about okay here this is a non-terminal rule called digit right non-terminal rule and why is it non-terminal is because i can say well what is a digit and then you'll continue on and say to me oh a digit yeah a digit contains a zero a one a two a three, a four, a five, a six, a seven, an eight, or a nine. So this digit here, it's surrounded by a chevron again. That means that this is a rule. And what does a digit consist of? Well, this is an assignment operator, and you must put two colons, and you must have an equal symbol. Accuracy in the exam is important here, people. Okay? Students always forget zeros as well. 
I am going to put that down, not to, not to stupidity, but through exam pressure. And a little bit of stupidity, right? So digits must have zeros. How will you how would you be able to represent a what uh, a ten, a twenty, a thirty, a hundred, a thousand? Okay, so you got to be careful. The pipe in between the straight line that is an or symbol. Okay, or symbol. So I might say, read it from right to left. Terminals cannot be evaluated any further. So a terminal is a symbol, a character. Or a digit. So here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, they are terminals. Symbols, well, hopefully, you know what symbols are. Characters and digits are also known as terminals. Pipes are ors. Terminals can be placed next to each other, and if they're put there like that, what rules can I have? I can have JBR, let me just get a pen again. I can have JBR1, JBR2, JBR3, JBR4, 5, 6, 7, etc. And that is called concatenation when you combine these terminals, J, a B, and an R, and then anything that can be a zero up to nine. That's called concatenation when you merge them together like that. So there you go, rules can be combined together. So you've got two digits in there, digit, digit, and that forms a two-digit rule. So you can have rules inside rules as well. That is also perfectly allowed. And then, in the exam questions that we've looked at, yes, you can put symbols, you can put terminals in final rules, yes. Terminals in final rules are fine, if they're on their own, yeah. So what types of resources online would you recommend for revising this? Um, to be honest, my YouTube channel is pretty good. Um, there is something as well called Isaac Computer Science, which they cover at Educast as well. That's government, government owned that. They bought them out. So, is it possible to define a single rule that can define any number of digits? So this is recursive. And for some reason... These two things here confuse people quite a lot, right? And there's no need for it. No need. So number, so if I'm looking for any length number, you can have a digit. A digit can be anything like we looked at before, anything from 0 to 9. Or you can have anything from 0 to 9 and, because it's concatenated, and another number. A number is the name. Oh, that was a good line. Number is the name of the procedure again. Right? So we start again. So if I wanted 2, 3, 7, yeah, you would go number. Do I want a single digit? No, I want 2, 3, and 7. So you go to this one and you say, right, I'm taking a 2 from here and I'm calling it again. Then you go, right, do you want a single digit? No, I want 3 and 7. Okay, so you want 3 this time. 3, take it. Go back to the start, go to number. Now I want 7. Yeah, I just want 1 now because it's just 7 on its own. And you take 2, 3, and 7 and you stop. Down here, the only difference is you've got a null operator as well, right? This means that you can have no numbers at all, one number from 0 to 9, or any length numbers that you want. So digits, any, any length that you want. The null allows you to have nothing at all. So you must read the question. If the question says... The person can decide whether they want it or don't want it, then you have to include null in there. And null is a base case because if you don't know what recursion is, okay, recursion is a function that calls itself, so the number, one second, number is the function name and it calls itself within itself until the base case or terminating condition is met. Would digit number null just be one number number? Would you mean one less than what? 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 What do you mean? More than one. Uh. 
uh, the rule digit number null. Yeah, that means that that would that would force you to have as many numbers. So you could have no numbers at all, or you could have as many length numbers as you want. If that makes sense. So null means you can have none at all. And then when you've got digit numbers, you can have any repeating amount of numbers, of digits, sorry, yeah, numbers. And the other thing that you might have to do with backers nor form once you've created your syntax is a diagram, okay? The diagram, this is from the appendix in the specification. And we draw diagrams, this is the same for anything in computer science, you draw diagrams to help humans because humans are stupid. So you help them because diagrams are easy to understand, okay? So we've got non-terminal symbols. That's a, that's a rectangle. And you'll see in the example uh, mark schemes that these lines are not included. I include them because I'm proper. I do it properly, right? Terminal symbols that I can oval and you put the terminal symbol directly inside and you have the flow of information. It's important that you put the arrow head on to show the flow of information as well. So you might take a rule like this, sign... Uh oh, I'm missing something from that. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, you didn't see anything. You didn't see anything. Okay, sign is assigned a plus or a minus symbol. Okay, what does that look like? Looks like that because you can come along, you can choose the plus and carry on, or you can come along and choose the minus and carry on. So that is the symbol for that one. Concatenation, what about this rule here? So to represent the two-digit rule, you would have the terminal, sorry, the non-terminal digit. So there's your rule, non-terminal digit, followed by non-terminal digit. The straight line means you must take a digit first from 0 to 9, carry on and take a second digit from 0 to 9, and then carry on with your life. Recursion is much more straightforward in syntax diagrams. So to repeat a section of the diagram, all you have to do is draw an arrow looping on itself. So you take this here. And there you go. You got your digit. So number is basically a digit repeated as many times as you want. So it just gets repeated. Carry on. You want another digit. You want another digit. You want another digit. You want another digit. And carry on. So what about this here? What about this question here then? The email address of staff at National Bank are made up of the first name followed by a full stop, followed by the surname, followed by a single digit, followed by the at sign, followed by nb.co.uk. All first names and surnames consist of lowercase letters only. And they can be of any length. Produce an appropriate syntax diagram to define the email address at National Bank five marks, produce an appropriate backers nor form definition for the email address for National Bank, four marks, and explain why programmers find both syntax diagrams and backers nor form notation preferable methods for describing the syntax of program languages compared to natural English. So that last one there, let's get that out of the way. It was for the reasons that I said before, okay? Because it's all about ambiguity, right? If we compare it to natural English, there is too much ambiguity involved in natural languages. Therefore, we need to use things like backers nor form to make our code unambiguous. All right. Uh, we'll do B first. So, and then I'll just show, I think I'll just show you A because it'll take too long otherwise. All right. How often will they ask you to draw every diagram? Uh, and the final one. Um, th th what I've seen, Cole, is they've taken, they've taken um, most of that out. They won't ask you to draw everything they usually just ask you to draw the final production rule now. That's what they've, that they've changed over the years. Okay. But when we produce a backers no form definition for email addresses, it says the email address of staff at National Bank are made up of first name, followed by a full stop, followed by surname, followed by a single digit. So one single digit. Okay. Now I'm going to need a digit rule. So I go ahead and I create my digit rule. And I've got colons, I've got equals symbol. Imagine that's two colons. Zero in there, one, 
to, and you can save a bit of time here by putting ellipses like that, and you can put uh, eight, nine if you want. That's perfectly allowed, you can do that. Also, it says there, all first names and surnames consist of lowercase letters only and can be of any length. So I'm gonna need letters. Define my letters. Colons, again, that was colons. It's not a division symbol. Oh, stupid pen. Uh, lowercase, so A, B, C, dot, 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 slash X, Y, Z. So I've got letters now, I've got digits, and now I need any length name. So I'll create something called rec letters. Colon equals, and I remember what I need, okay? So I need, I can have a single letter, right? Single letter or letters, should I say? Or you can have letters. And to make this recursive, you've got to call the name of the function again. So I'm going to put rec underscore letters in there to make it recursive. Okay, now it's recursive. So I've got any length name that I want in there. And all I've got to do now is produce the email address itself. So here's my final production rule, which is the culmination of all of these different rules together. Email, and it says you've got a first first name, so I'll call rec letters for the first name. So mine would be John. Followed by a full stop. And as Cole mentioned before, I'm allowed to put terminals in my final production rule as they stand. I don't need a special rule for a full stop because it's a terminal. There's my surname. So first name, full stop surname. Uh, and then what, what else was it? Followed by a single digit. So I'll put there single digit rule. And then I'll put at nb.co.uk. And again, I can put that there because it's just a bunch of terminals, okay? No, nope, you don't need to put the full stop in quotes. No, not at all. Just put it as is if you want to. Now, what I'll do is I'll just uh, shimmy on over. Yeah, I did letters like that. I did digit like that. I did, yeah, I did that as well. I've got a full stop there in the mark scheme. Get my, get my highlighter out. Oh no, not my highlighter. Just get a laser pointer. Yeah, full stop, name, digit, at mb. Yeah, I did that. One mark for recursion. Same uh, same item, left and right, I needed. Yeah, I did that. Cannot gain full marks unless completely correct. What? Crazy stuff. So the diagram's on the right-hand side there. It's quite rare now. Like, again, what that was said before. It's quite rare that they ask you to do a diagram for all of the rules that you've created. But that means you can basically say, right, I want a B and carry on with my life. Or I want a seven, carry on with my life. This is the final production rule. So as many lowercase letters as you want, the terminal at the full stop, as many lowercase letters as you want for the surname, the digit itself, and then nb.co.uk to finish off. Okay. Happy days. Look at that. Right, let's go past these questions. And that's it. Well, there's another one for you if you want the mark scheme on there as well, if you want to check your answers. So you can have a go at that and check the mark scheme by all means. Jacob will be fine. So what's that? Right, legislation done. I'm ticking these off on my little board. Principles of programming completed. So um, people asked me to cover. Oh, here we go. What do people want here now? So I've got changeover and maintenance and documentation in 1.5 or 1.8 program construction. That's compilers, interpreters, assemblers, execution and translation errors. Them two came out even. So which one do you want first?
Subban got in there first. Oh my goodness. All of them. Rayhan, you can't be putting all your eggs in one basket with a live stream, my friend. Oh, we're going to end up doing both here, aren't we? Yeah, we're going to end up working overtime at this rate. Okay, people. Okay. The people have spoken 1.8. It is. So we've got compilers, interpreters, assemblers. The stages of the compilation process. Notice it's not the stages of the interpretation or the assembly process. It's compiling the comp compilation process only. All right. And we've also got translation and execution errors. Okay. I have a feeling that they're going to come up. That's just a hunch, by the way. Don't quote me on that. So, program construction. Look at that. Uh, at the top, we have high level, high level languages. These are these are known as fourth generation languages at the top there. By the way, fourth generation languages, um, and Python's up there now, and like Java and stuff like that. Uh, we do have fifth generation and even sixth generation languages, and we've moved further into different um, program creators like. Again, AI is like a fifth, sixth generation language. Down, all the way down to the lowest level that we can possibly, we can possibly get to. And that's hardware. Okay, hardware is the lowest level that we can get to. And that's machine code, isn't it? Isn't it though? Yes. What are those? What are those? Those three things are all types of translators, people. Compilers, interpreters, and assemblers. We use the term translators to cover all types of software, right? All types of software that convert code from one form to another. I'll say that again. They convert code from one form to another. So let's talk about compilers, right? I think you'll be asked about the difference between two of them, right? So compilers, they convert source code written in a high-level language into machine code. Yeah, of course, they all do, right? They all do. But what's different about compilers is they do it in a different way. They produce a standalone executable file, and there is no need for further compilation. It gets compiled once, and it's done. It can be run many times, therefore, it's quite efficient. You just compile once, might take a little bit of time, but once it's done, you just run an exe file, an exe, and it can be run whenever you want, wherever you want. However, it is platform specific. So if I create an exe file, it's for Windows, right? It can't be run on Apple devices, right? Now, when you compile your code, it protects the intellectual property of the developer if that's what you're bothered about. However, some people go open source and release their source code anyway. So compilers, one standalone executable file, compiled once, ran many times, and it is platform specific. Interpreters, they handle it very differently. Interpreters like Python, the Python, the Python idle, okay, can you not get to source code from EXEs at all? No. Designed that way on purpose. That, blame Bill Gates for that. Right? An interpreter handles the job of translating code very differently than, con than a compiler. Right? It translates each line of code into machine code line by line. And as we do that, we can, base we can see each line of code as we're trying to interpret it. And therefore, intellectual property has now been destroyed. It's gone. Right? Someone can see all of your code, and the interpreter takes the first line of source code, translates it, and executes it before moving on to the next one. Right? Therefore, it's a slower process, people. It is a slower process. Any machine code produced while the interpreter is running is not saved. That means the next time you run this, you're going to have to do the same process all over again. So your question, and quite rightly so, should be, well, what's the point in that, John? What is the point in using interpreters if I've got to do all that slow process all over again? Well, the reason is, is because interpreters are not platform specific. You can use them on any computer. The Python idle that gets used, I've, I've got that on every computer that I own, right? The idle, the I-D-L-E, idle, that 
is an interpreter. I stick the Python code into it and it spits it out specific for the Apple Mac architecture or the Windows architecture, Linux, all that sort of stuff. Interpreters are not language specific, no. Oh, sorry, no, they are, what am I talking about? Yes, some languages are interpreted and some languages are compiled. So interpreters are commonly used for a number of languages, so like basic, Lisp, Prolog, Python, JavaScript, stuff like that. In order to be able to run an interpreted language, you must have an interpreter installed. That's a piece of software that does the, the interpretation. Interpreted language can be run on any system as long as the interpreter has been installed. So when you've got 800 machines like my college, that can be annoying because you've got to install it on all those machines first before we run any code whatsoever. Interpreters, source code has to be written once and then it can be run with a computer with an interpreter installed. You can easily inspect the contents of variables and test it as you go in because it's line by line. And also code can be run on many different platforms. So they're the advantages of our interpreters. Now, what about the disadvantages then? Okay, so you've got to have the interpreter running and installed. Source code needs to be compiled or interpreted, should I say, each time. And that's quite slow. You must also rely on the interpreter itself for something called machine level optimizations rather than programming them yourself because we don't know how the code will react on a Windows machine, a Linux machine, etc. So we have to rely on the interpreter itself to make the optimizations for the operating system that we're using. Okay. Now a little, uh, you can again, you can pause this and have a look at that. Um, this basically separates, these are things that I've been asked in the past really. Source code for compilers are hidden. Source code for interpreters are shown. The compiler can be used on one platform only. Interpreter, multiple platforms providing it's installed. And what about distribution? How easy is it to send software out there? Well, with a compiled program, executable can be put on a memory stick, a CD drive, an email dropped into a Google Drive, whatever. Interpreter, systems need to be set up before the code can run, uh, and that, can, that has to include as well installing libraries and files. So we've had loads of issues with installing libraries into um, Python interpreters. What a faff. But once it's done, it's done. All right. So that's compilers and interpreters. And what about assemblers? Assemblers, they just take assembly language code and write it to machine code directly. It is extremely fast. And where do we use assembly language? Usually in hardware, like your washing machine, dishwashers, that kind of stuff. Things that require straightaway action, right? Also, to make low-level programming more manageable, we designed this assembly language, right? Now assembly, what's good about assembly, it has something called a direct mapping or a one-to-one -one mapping with machine code. So each assembly code instruction has a one-to-one -one mapping with machine code instruction. And that's why it's so fast. So you, what commands do you know, I wonder, in assembly language? Assembly language doesn't come up on this uh, component one. However, you might have heard of commands like LDA, yeah? Load, it, load the address or load a position. STA, store that, okay? HLT commands, halt, add commands. Yeah, all assembly language, that add command will have some kind of machine code for it, and that is unique to that command. Therefore, it's very quick. Well done, Charlie. Yes, HLT commands. Oh, assembly language programming is fun as well. I'm sure we'll do that in the next one. So assembly code as a one-to-one -one mapping. We first take the labels, we convert them into memory addresses and store them in something called a symbol table. This is going a little bit further than the A-level, in my opinion, okay? The second phase of getting assembly into machine code involves converting the mnemonics 
into their binary representations. And new, the mnemonic is the HLT, the ADD, and the STA. They're mnemonics. It's a shortened version of the of the word. All right, combining them with binary representations of the data. So that just means converting HLT into some kind of binary. All right. So when we write machine code, we don't like it. We don't do it. Why? It's very prone to errors. It's very time consuming. Okay. So we don't do it. So when converting assembly to machine code, you use an assembler, which is a form of translator, which we know now. And converting assembly into machine code is obviously known as assembling rather than compiling. And obviously, interpreting, compiling, and assembling, they're three different things. So let me put it in a little diagram for you. You take your source code. You can go two ways. You can go interpretation or comp compilation. It's up to you. If you're interpreting, make sure you've got software installed and it'll convert directly to binary. If you've got uh, object code, so when you compile, you'll turn your source code into object code. You'll have libraries included in that as well. So if I'm programming in a language, I might have different packages that I'm using that I need. I need to combine the libraries with my object code and that is called the linker. The linker does that. It goes through the linking process and combines those two together into one executable file and I can run it on my computer. Now there is an extra step that you can go through and that's um, semi-compiling your code into something called intermediate code. Yes. Now intermediate code is quite fascinating because you use an interpreter to actually run intermediate code and you can do that on any platform. Why might you do that? Well, you might use a virtual machine to do that. So let's talk about virtual machines just for a second. And a virtual machine is a computer operating system inside another computer operating system. So there on the screen, you can see I'm running a Windows operating system. Sorry, I'm running a, an Apple operating system with a Windows operating system floating in between. And why, why would we do that? Because some software is developed for Windows and some software is developed for Mac and they don't talk to each other. And why not? Because back in the day, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs detested each other and didn't like it. So they obviously they want a bigger share of the market and they don't share across. So virtual machines have been around for a long time and what they do is they give you the essence of emulating something else inside something else. So yes, Charlie, um, VMs are used for emulation of games consoles, yeah. So virtual machines act as interpreters for generic machine code instructions known as intermediate code. That means I can run my Windows software in an Apple architecture. That's what virtual machines are for. Virtual machines, they run intermediate code that has previously been compiled and source code is compiled into intermediate code to prevent incompatibilities. So it gets into a semi-compiled state and then it will finally convert the last bit into the architecture that you're running it on, such as Apple, for example. And that all happens, You all runs and it gets abstracted away from you. There's so much complexity involved in it, but it looks really simple. You just run your virtual machine, put, put your code in and happy days. All right, so that's the process there. Now, we talk about compilation. This is, in my opinion, this is pretty tricky for people, especially students over the years that I've seen, they tend to struggle with the different stages of the compilation process. So you've got lexical analysis, syntax analysis, something called semantic analysis as well. Then you've got machine code generation and then you've got linking involved in that as well. All right, we saw what linking was before. That's where we add our libraries into our code. So let's start with lexical analysis, All right? As I said in class, if you've ever seen Countdown, you'll know that there's a dictionary corner and there's a lexographer called Susie Dent. A lexographer is basically the meaning of words, All right? There's a bit of source code on the right hand side little bit of source code for you. If score is greater than 40, then console, write you've passed, else write you've failed. Right, nice and simple. So during lexical analysis, 
all the white space and unneeded punctuation, code comments and all that sort of stuff is removed, all right? The tokens, which is like the if, score, greater than symbol, 40, then, their tokens, they all get turned into, it gets tokenized, right? They get turned into tokens uh, and then error messages are produced if it can't do any of the steps, all right? And that's what tokenized code looks like there. I've just drawn boxes around it so you can clearly see which parts of the code have been tokenized. Then, after that, we create something called a symbol table from the tokenized code. And a symbol table or a dictionary gets created and they'll refer to this in your exam as a reserve word and an identifier table. So after you've done your lexical analysis and you've broken everything down to tokens, syntax analysis is to analyze the syntax. So you put all of those things that have been tokenized there, you put it into two tables, a reserve word table and an identifier table. Has anyone ever seen identifier tables and reserve word tables before in their computer science study? Am I teaching you to suck eggs here or have you not heard of these? That's good news. Tokens are checked to fit the grammar using things like backers nor form or regular expressions or even something called reverse Polish notation, which has been taken off the specification, thank goodness, so you don't have to learn that. Then we generate abstract syntax trees, and if it doesn't fit the grammar of the language or it fails on any of the backers nor form stages, then you produce an error message. So here's a typical question that you might see in your exam. Below is a segment of source code, source program that is to be compiled, input basic cost, VAT, basic cost and multiply, etc., etc. right? Then it says construct a reserve word table and an identifier table that could be used to translate the segment of code into a stream of hex tokens. So it wants you to split it up. So let's create our reserve word table there we go. And let's create our, our identifier table. Can anyone tell me what the difference is between a reserve word and an identifier? What is the difference between a reserve word and an identifier? Any idea? Hmm, I wonder. Reserve words are already in the system. Correct, Mucket, well done. Reserve words are already inside the programming language. The identifier, as Charlie has said, right? The identifier is what you create. That's why the identifier table has an extra column. You'll hopefully you notice that. The extra column here is for the data type because you have created those, okay? People say, John, for the hex tokens, what do I actually write in there? Well, it doesn't matter what you write in there. As long as you give me a hexadecimal value, and normally the exam board, they prove it's a hexadecimal value by putting a letter there. All right. So my advice is um, two digits, 5C, 2C, 2D, 2E, etc. Put a letter in there because it shows the examiner that it's definitely some kind of hexadecimal value. Because you could put one and two and three, yeah, but it, the examiner could think that you're doing base 10 values there. So play it safe, people. Play it safe, okay? Then, in your lexical analyzer, uh, for your syntax analysis, you, I talked about regular expressions before. You won't get quizzed on regular expressions um, my class goes through a little um, experiment with regular expressions just to get a little feel for them um, and you can build regular expressions up and they are very, very powerful. We use them normally for validation um, but they look weird, like really weird. If you go into proper regular expressions, if you Google 
um, I don't know, postcode, regular expression or something, they do get complicated with strange symbols. But they're very, very powerful and quite good to use. But again, you won't get asked on those, but you might, you could you could always throw it in there and say all oh, regular expressions are all about, um, or are used in the syntax analysis stage, should I say. Okay. Right, so then we've done lexical, syntax, and now the syntax has passed and we're on to semantic analysis. So semantics is checking that all the variables have been declared and they've been used. In some languages, if you don't use the variable, it will have like a green squiggly line underneath it or it will say you've not used it. It'll get removed anyway, but you're wasting memory because you've assigned registers to that variable. So check that all the things like real values or floating point values have been assigned to uh, have not been assigned to integers, for example, because if you assign a floating point value into an integer value, it will truncate the number. So that will be a loss of accuracy, which will result in an incorrect output. It also checks that the operation is legal. So you can't have any mixed mode arithmetic. Right? Mixed mode arithmetic. I see people do this in exams, even at A2, second year, I'll see uh, things like this. Equal to great, oh, uh, greater than. Right? What the hell is that? It's greater than or equal to people. No Matibi don't. Right? So you need to put it the right way around, people. Greater than or equal to. Right? No mixed mode arithmetic. Then finally as well, reverse Polish notation will be used. I talked about this before very briefly. But again, it's you can write it down. It will be in mark schemes, but it's not expected because it got taken out of the spec. All right? Then, semantic analysis, right? Once the string of tokens has been generated, the syntax analyzer part of the compiler checks whether the sequence of tokens is an, in an acceptable order. So... Here are two token streams, variable equals constant, constant equals variable. So if you've got your variable, can you assign a constant into a variable? Can you assign a variable into a constant? Which one is allowed and which one is not? I'm not sure, Jacob. I'm just going to carry on for a bit. Can you assign a constant into a variable? And can you assign a variable into a constant? Hmm. One is wrong, one is right. Which one is it? That's the question. Hmm. Interesting. No one know? So you can't. Oh, second one is right. <laughs> Now, a constant value can be put inside a variable, but you cannot change a constant. So this one is wrong. That one is correct. And that's the kind of thing that we're checking. All right. That's all. No worries. There we go. The first is acceptable. The second is not. So with semantic analysis, if you don't stick to the rules, look what's happened again. At all stages of lexical syntax semantic analysis, if there is an error at that stage, do not continue compiling. I'll do my best, Matib, but it's not easy. So what actually is a syntax error? A syntax error, you'd say, oh, it's an error in your syntax, right? But we get errors, syntax errors, when the tokens passed into the compiler don't match any of the rules of the compiler. The syntax has to be, uh, you do get a semantic error call, but we'll talk about that in a second, okay? Once the syntax has been checked, it has to be 100% correct before we can move on to build something called an abstract syntax tree. And an abstract syntax tree looks like something that you would have studied before. To you, that might look like a binary search tree. All right. And it works in a similar way, to be fair. However, the nodes of the abstract syntax tree get changed for machine code. So in order to do code generation, the compiler performs three tasks. It converts the elements of that syntax tree into machine code. It allocates registers 
to minimize the memory access and it also optimizes the machine code at the same time to improve the efficiency, okay? So compilers optimize the code and then it gets converted into its ex executable file. Interpreters, like I said before, they do optimization live for that specific architecture set, whether it's Windows or Linux or whatever, okay? So with optimizing machine code, everybody's aware that programmers will write code inefficiently. Nobody really cares about writing code um, with memory in mind anymore because memory is so abundant. But the higher the level we go with our coding, the more sloppy our coding gets. If I program in assembly language, it's very, very specific, okay? Most programmers don't even know or care that their code is inefficient, and that's that means many compilers, they perform optimizations for the developer on their behalf. So one way to speed up a program is to limit the number of jumps it has to do, and you might remember the word jumps from the fetch decode execute cycle. That's just one way of improving and speeding up, okay? So let's talk about our errors now. We have execution errors. So execution errors, they're also known as something called runtime errors. And they occur when the program is running, obviously. Right? So runtime errors are errors that will cause the program or the computer to crash, even if there appears to be nothing wrong with the program code. So the program will still compile, but things like running out of memory will cause a runtime error, uh, or dividing by zero, um, overflow, so like uh, you've got um, your data structure uh, goes out of the bounds, for example, or you're trying to access something out of the bounds, underflow, overflow, that kind of stuff, uh, reading past the end of a file. So all of those are examples of execution errors. And the other type of error that you can get is called a translation error. So for example, syntax errors are, are translation errors, and this happens through the compilation process. So at any point through the compilation process, you get an error. It's called a translation error because it's an error while you're trying to just translate the code into machine code, isn't it? And you've got syntax errors involved in there when there's um, errors in the syntax. You have um, translators that can only execute a program if the code is syntactically correct. So common syntax errors are things like spelling mistakes or keywords, incorrect imports and stuff like that. Semantic errors for what was discussed before, Cole, was illegal variables have been used or haven't been declared yet. And this happens a lot in Python because it's important that when you declare your procedures, they're in the right order. So you can't declare a procedure after you've referenced it, right? So it comes up with weird errors. And also you have linking errors as well. So that's where your libraries haven't been linked properly to the project and you're trying to call it and use it. It doesn't work, okay? Now then, that's 1.8 done, all right? Um, I will cover the bits in 1.5 that people asked me to cover and then we'll evaluate how much time we've got left. I don't want to go on all night. I'm getting dry mouth over here. It's hard work presenting this much, people. Hard work. Right, 1.5. The first thing people asked me to talk about was changeover. Can anyone give me any types of changeover? There you go. It's over to you now. Any types of changeover? Direct Mucket, well done. Pilot, yes, parallel. Direct, phased, parallel, pilot, good. Now I'm hoping this comes up because this is traditionally a well-answered question. So first we've got direct changeover. Why are we using, cha what is changeover about firstly? In the software development lifecycle, when we implement a new piece of software, we have to change it over. So we either get rid of the old one, but it's how we get rid of the old one is what we're talking about here, right? So we've got direct changeover, often referred to as the Big Bang. 
right? The complete changeover of everything in a single pass. It is the highest risk of all. It is not the preferred method, but if needs must, you have to basically direct changeover, straight swap. You have pilot changeover, which is a bit more preferred. So I always think about supermarkets. Sainsbury's, they trialed their new um, till systems with their cashierless tills. They did that in a small number of stores across the UK, which if it went wrong, it would have minimal impact. Minimal impact. So a few stores trial it first with a pilot study, and then they'll roll it out once all the bugs have been resolved, and that's minimal inconvenience. We've got parallel changeover, which is fantastic, providing that you've got a lot of resource, because two systems will be running at exactly the same time. So that means if a problem occurs with the new system, you can basically just drop onto the old system and continue running, producing invoices and sorting your databases out, etc., through your old system. All right. And then there's phased changeover. So changeovers typically happen one one department at a time. So finance, then human resources, then marketing. Larger organizations or organizations undergoing significant change might select this method as they uh, would be much more vulnerable to bugs. So in our college, we rolled out the, the uh, Google platform across all departments bit by bit. And then we rolled out um, Google Drive first, then Google Classroom, and then Gmail. And we're doing that as a phased changeover. So we're replacing our old systems with new systems, right? So that's changeover in a nutshell. Now, you also asked for maintenance as well. Can anyone tell me the three types of maintenance that we have? Over to you again. Three types of maintenance. What have we got? Well done, adaptive, corrective, and perfective changeover. Again, another good one that I would like to come up because it's uh, students can get their teeth stuck into this one. So if you think about perfective maintenance, if something is perfect, what types of organizations would pilot and parallel be good for? Um, types of organizations. So like I said before, with pilot, I was talking about supermarkets where you've got lots of different stores. So if you've got the same thing happening on many different sites, pilot changeover is a good way to go. Pilot changeover is when there there can be no risk. So that like large scale e-commerce, think about Amazon. If Amazon's system went down, they need to jump straight back onto their old system to make sure they're still maintaining their um, e-commerce business because any downtime for them would be very costly. So anyway, back to maintenance. Maintenance, so perfective maintenance. If something's perfect, it aims to make a functioning system even better, perhaps by adding multiple input methods, speeding up network connections, tweaking an interface. Um, system must match the specification perfectly, and it's very expensive because it's so meticulous and it's so perfectly tested after any implementation has happened. So perfective maintenance is the best of all. However, it is very expensive. Adaptive maintenance is when changes to a system are required. So that might be GDPR coming in where everyone needed cookies, uh, ask for cookies, for example, or data. Uh, you can't take all the data that you used to be able to take anymore. VAT rate could change, for example, and that would impact um, like Sage uh, accountancy systems and things like that. So changes might need to be made there. And that's where adaptive maintenance comes in. It's quite common, actually, to, to have adaptive maintenance on your system. And then finally, corrective maintenance. You don't really want to use corrective maintenance because it just means that you, you didn't test well enough in the software development lifecycle anyway. So it exists to remove bugs that were not addressed during testing. And you know what? Sometimes bugs always tend to get out, and I'm sure you've played some games before that have had glitches and bugs and stuff like that. And you've had, you, the company has had to send out patches um, I know iOS and things like that, they always send out software updates and patches. And that's just corrective maintenance. That's all that is. All right. That's all that is. And then, so that's maintenance as well in a nutshell. And then we talk about documentation. So you have maintenance documentation. 
So when you maintain your software, you might produce some things. So you might produce something called annotated listings. All right, it could be diagrams as well, like algorithms and variable lists, data dictionaries, class diagrams, and a list of subroutines that have been included now, or even an into relationship diagram or model if you're working with databases, right? Annotated listings might just be uh, c comments and things like that as well. Um, but that is a very sort of simple look at maintenance documentation. Let me just go and find, there are more documentation bits involved with this as well. There we go. So when you're developing through the software development lifecycle, there are a number of different types of documentation. There's three in total. The first one is internal documentation. So when you maintain something, you've got the code itself, okay? Now, you have printouts of the code, you use sensible names on the code, good comments on the code that are informative, and a good layout and structure to the code. Now, that would get passed directly between development teams. You'd never give that to the end user, would you? Right? Because they won't understand any of it. Then you've got technical documentation, which also goes to the development teams. This is written by the developer for another developer. So if you're trying to pass it on to someone else and explain what you've done, that might be all the technical specification, all the diagrams used when designing the new piece of software, and also all the test logs, whether it's white box, black box testing, alpha, beta, whatever, all of the testing documentation goes in there and that is extremely thorough, all right? Then you've got the user documentation. That is the end user getting documentation. So no technical information at all, no jargon, nothing like that. Usually it's how to install or uninstall programs and how to use programs to resolve problems, all right? Um, or it might be even a diagram of the map of the game, for example. That kind of stuff is used in documentation. Right? All three of those need producing through the software development lifecycle. Nobody likes doing it. Nobody. But we have to do it. All right? Have to do it. So they're the three bits that people wanted me to cover from the questionnaire that I sent out. Um, someone asked me to also look at human-computer interaction. And there's only one slide for this you'll be pleased to know. So you've got HCI, human computer interaction, that's how the user interacts with your system, okay? Interacts with your system. You have a command line interface. Command line interfaces are very hard to use because you need um, a good level of knowledge to actually use command line interfaces. That might be a Linux system or something like that. So simply put, the user indicates their desired action by typing the command and pressing enter. You get very quick responses. There's no processor time lost because you're not compu uh, computing graphics. Also, you can work on a very low spec machine so you don't need any real serious hardware. It is more difficult to learn for novice users commands um, can be memorized. So anyone that's done the Cyber Centurion with us, you'll know what that what that means. All right, it's very difficult. Um, then you've got your graphic user interface. This is what you're used to, and it came. Graphic user interfaces were born out of MS DOS, which is an old Windows thing. You can Google that as well if you want. I feel old even talking about it. Graphic user interfaces typically consist of the following elements. So you've got um, Windows, icons, menus, and pointers. And we use the acronym, the mnemonic WIMP, to talk about that. Windows, icons, menus, and pointers. And you can click on stuff, and it's much more intuitive because it's click and, click and, not drag and drop, click, click whatever you want, and off you go, right? And that's why iPads caught on with young people because it's just tap away, all right? Then you've got one something called forms interface as well. And it's usually developed as a part of GUI, and a forms interface guides a user through a particular process such as registering for an email account or installing a program uh, it's like a wizard um, you used to get old wizards that used to guide you through the installation process right uh, and then it makes sure that the users have done all the steps to help you out right so human computer interaction is how the user interacts with the software All right, well, one thing, 
I will send out some stuff, okay? So I'm beginning to start wrapping this up now. I'll just talk about rogues and rogue values and count values for a second, and then I'll talk about what I'll do next for you to, to wrap this up. Because I know some people wanted sorting and big O notation and stuff like that. So using count and rogue values with loops. We talk about loops specifically because this is where we apply counts and rogue values. And when I say what is a count value and what is a rogue value, simply put, a count value increments every time through the loop to keep track of where you're at, right? So you terminate when you reach that required amount. A rogue value is a specific value that ends the iteration. So let me talk through an example with you. Here is some code which basically says count equals zero, repeat until count equals 10, input some data, increment the count every time by one, so it will go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, stop. That is a count variable, simple as that. So if a, root, if a loop must be repeated a no number of times, a count can be used. When the count reaches the required number, the loop will terminate. A rogue value on the right hand side here, totally set to zero, repeat until a specific condition. So where age equals minus one, that's our specific condition this time. And it says input your age. If your age is greater than zero, then total is given the value of total plus the age on top, end the if. Then it goes back, checks the post condition loop here, checks to see if it's minus one. So a rogue value is a value that falls outside the range of possible values for the data being processed that will cause the loop to terminate. So age equals minus one is the rogue value that will terminate, okay? So don't get confused between those two if you do see them. Right, okay people, two hours and 22 minutes. Okay, now I do know on my list here, I've done 1.9 legislation, 1.4 principles of programming, 1.8 program construction, 1.5 changeover, maintenance and documentation, 1.6 HCI, and then counting and rogue values from 1.3. Now, those people that asked for um, sorting and uh, sorting algorithms, so that was uh, the bubble insertion and the quick sort, I have videos on all three of those. Um, the only thing I've not done is actually program them in, oh no, I have, I have programmed in Python and made videos of them, I'm pretty sure. They are all on my YouTube channel. So what I will do is say, go and watch them. And if you have questions, then please, by all means, email JBR, so J-B-R, Jonathan Barker, that's my name, at osfc.ac.uk ask me some questions, I'll more than happily respond to you for that. Um, for the Big O notation, I do have videos on Big O as well, uh, but you are more than welcome to send me some questions on that. Um, moderated coursework, not yet, Matib. We won't hear anything about that until we get the um, results back. So that's A-level results day, and we'll get the, the moderation report then. Okay, so we won't hear anything from here on in, unfortunately. So you just got to hope and pray that your grades are good. It's not that likely, Cole. It's not that likely. The way moderation works is there is a tolerance level. So your teacher marks it. They check the tolerance level. Someone else will mark it and compare it against the teacher's marking. If it's within the tolerance level, it's a tick in the box. Um, go through all the students. So depending on your cohort size, it'll go through all the students. They'll work out that kind of stuff, and then that's all good. Um, yeah, Charlie, yeah, I did get your email. I've seen it. It's on my phone over here. Um, I will do that straight after the live stream for you. No problem. All right? People, I wish you the best of luck. I really, really do. Um, for those people that I've taught, I didn't teach many of you for two years. I taught you for one year um, because I didn't teach AS two years ago. So um, I wish you the best of luck, and... Make sure you're on time. It is a PM exam, so you can get up uh, in plenty of time. Come into college by all means. I 
I am pretty sure I can find a room for you if you want to come in on Friday morning. No problem whatsoever. Um, I'm glad it's been useful. I'm glad it's been helpful. I appreciate your uh, positive comments. Oh, you've got chemistry. That's not good. Nothing I can do about that, Cole, unfortunately. It's, it's a shame. Double booked yourself. All right. Um, even if there's just two or three or four or five students, it's well, well worth it. Um, so thanks very much, people. I'll see you soon. Let me know if you want the uh, resources and I'll send them over straight away. All right. See you soon, people. Bye-bye.